2024. Uh, in attendance in person is uh, our board members Luke Ferrin, Julian McCormick, and Tom Kempner. And via Zoom, we have Joyce Jifra. Uh, also, here is uh, our legal counsel, Brian Stoller, and our village planner, Alex Wallach, and our environmental consultant, Chick Voorhees. So we can um, open the meeting for tonight. And the first order of business we have is to uh, finalize a written decision with respect to case number 3169, Adrian and Thomas Anderman, 153 Bishops Lane. I believe to date we have two votes in favor of the decision as written, denying the variance request, one vote against the decision, denying the variance request, and we still need, Tom, your vote and Joyce's vote. I'm in favor of the opinion. And Joyce, can you hear us okay? Yes, I'm uh, in favor of the decision as well. <laughs> okay, so the board votes four to one to... Oh, uh, I would do it by motion. Since we had a motion that didn't pass last oh. time, I'd do it by motion again this time. Okay. So I'll motion to uh, deny the variance requests requested in case number 3169, 153 Bishops Lane, uh, and to approve the decision as written by our legal counsel. Can I have a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. And one Aye. vote against. Brian, do you have a copy of that that you can send to me? I'm back online. To me. Great, excellent, thank you. Okay, next we have a request for an adjournment to July 25th, 2024, in case number 3176, 51 Hill Street, so LLC. This is, this is being uh, reopened at the board's request. Um, so there's a um, note here that the July 9th meeting uh, was to be canceled. So I might suggest that the board formally cancel that meeting and all cases adjourned to that date will get carried over to, to, uh, carried over to July 25th. Do we need a motion to cancel the July 9th meeting? Oh, you have. If you have a hearing on, uh, as is the case here with 51 Hill Street, I would recommend that you do that. That you cancel it formally, and then any hearings that are have previously been scheduled for that date be adjourned to the following meeting date. Okay, so I'll, I'll motion to uh, cancel the public hearing scheduled for July 9th, 2024. Can I have a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And then Aye. now we. Now we can motion to accept the applicant's request in case number 3176, 51 Hill Street, to adjourn their application to the next public hearing, July 25th, 2024. Can I have a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> so we can go to our first carryover case, case number 3151, okay. Alexander. Before you, before you call that case, I have case, my firm has case number 12. I was wondering if you could take two 1750 water vision in front of people here and have some conflicting schedules. I would greatly appreciate the courtesy. I have the first. Oh, sure. Just to flip two to number one? That's okay. Okay. That's if it's okay with your. Thank you. Um, your applicant, sure. Yep. Okay. So we will then. Um, Commence first with case number 3155, 1750 Waterview, LLC, 1750 Meadow Lane. Make sure before the start I have that. Uh, give Brian the affidavit as opposed to you. Do you know? Confirm the receipt of the affidavit of posting. Now part of the file. Good evening, Richard Warren here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, we were last here on February 22nd, and we learned during that meeting that a report was going to be issued from Nelson Pope and Voorhees, who received that report on March 1st. Uh, the report was extensive and required considerable effort on our part to address the items that were contained in it. It took us several months, that's why we are now back here in June. 
Um, to address the memo, the plans were slightly modified and additional data, both technical response as well as legal responses, were submitted to the Zoning Board of Appeals. It was an expensive and considerable effort on the part of the project team. The residents and the swimming pool were, and patios were redesigned and shifted. The sanitary system was redesigned and shifted, and the drainage plans were modified to increase stormwater runoff control. For more details regarding the residents, the floor plan of the residents was redesigned by the architect in order to accommodate a reduction in the north westerly corner of the residence. This, this corner of the residence right in through here was pulled back um, because of the, there was a concern raised about the um, position of the structure relative to the wetlands that are over in this area here. Um, recognize that the swimming pool that currently exists is in this location out here, so there is a reduction in the structure in the corner from what currently exists. Uh, the closest point of the new residence now is at 82.3 feet set back from the wetlands. It's no closer than what's existing for the existing house. The nearest existing structure on the property is 30.8 feet from the wetlands. So there's a 52-foot increase in the wetland setback of structures on the property. The entry stair from the last version you saw, which was previously proposed at 64.4 feet, that's now at 83 feet. On the seaward side of the residence, the swimming pool and patios were redesigned. So now the swimming pool meets the 150-foot wetland setback, and the seaward edge of the improvements match the dollar line setback that was on the approved 2006 variance issued by this board. Regarding the sanitary system, the sanitary engineer re-examined the septic system, and the system was shifted to meet the village's 200-foot wetland setback. The new system represents a dramatic shift in what currently exists, because the existing system the septic tank is 89 feet from wetlands, and the septic, the leaching pools are 96 feet from wetlands. Um, th those systems in the last approval that this board granted uh, were allowed to remain, and a new system was put in the corner where we now propose the system, which is up in here, shown in green on the plan. So that's the new proposed system. The existing system is right here. And the new system obviously is updated with IA low technology, um, so it will provide better environmental conditions with that. Um, Wait, say that again about the technology. So, with with a new new home here, we'll have IA technology, so it'll be new low low nitrogen technology for the new system. Where in the last approval that this board approved, it was not low nitrogen technology. Thank you. Yep. <coughs> The, the uh, drainage system was redesigned on the, on the project. We were asked to provide additional drainage. Um, the plans that were previously submitted to the village had two inches of stormwater runoff control, which is typical for municipalities on the east end um, for impervious surfaces. The village code doesn't contain any code requirement for two inches, but we provided two inches the last time through. We were asked to provide some additional drainage, so. The landscape architect worked very hard to provide some additional drainage, and that's, that additional drainage is shown on, on the plans. There's additional drainage put right in this location here. There's additional drainage located up in here. It's, this is the landscape plan, but it's on the drainage plan. Then additional drainage in through here. Now that the drainage systems are using a Coltec drainage uh, design, which allows for sh a shallow depth um, system, so we didn't have to bring in any additional fill. The tennis court also has drainage control underneath it, which is being designed with a pervious hydro court and 20-inch diameter PVC piping to allow for storage and recharge. The, uh, the design that we've done, um, the site coverage within the 125-foot wetland setback has improved. Um, under the existing coverage within the wetland setback, it's 14,320 square feet. That was reduced to 11,536 square feet on the last plan. And now on this plan, it's further reduced to 10,279 square feet. So there's a, a fairly significant reduction in coverage within the 125-foot wetland setback. Within a 150-foot setback, at present, there's 17,442 square feet. The last plan was 17,051 square feet. 
a, a kind of a modest reduction. Now it's down to 15,215 square feet. So we have tightened the plan up in order to reduce the coverage within the setbacks. At the last submission that we made to you, the board had requested the removal of the eastern driveway. That remains part of the plan. And throughout this process, we've worked hard to reduce coverage and try to improve setbacks on this property. Um, it's clear to us that this proposed plan has dramatic environmental improvements when you consider over what exists today. And we believe that that's one of the standards that you are, are to look at when you examine this. The, extents of the, of the extensiveness of the February 29th memorandum you know, took us a little bit by surprise. It was 29 pages with an additional 18 pages of attachments. You know, I've practiced before this board for over 40 years, um, and I've never seen a report like that for any residential application in this village, um, excepting one, which was the 2020 Meadow Lane, which was nearly identical in the scope and the depth of the report that was submitted to this board, but that application was withdrawn. So it really took us a bit to recenter, you know, and we provided a lot of information back to this board. And that's why it took us some time, because it was an extensive report and required a lot of information. Um, so in the submission that you had before you right now, you've got revised architectural plans from Stel Lamont and Rowani. You've got revised landscape and drainage plans from LaGuardia Design. You've got a revised surveys from Squires and Holden. You've got a revised comparative setback analysis showing existing and proposed improvements and their setbacks to both wetlands and the Dolliver line. You've got a revised wetland analysis from InterScience that contains response regarding the impacts of this project to the on-site wetlands. There's a separate wetlands analysis that's been provided by Dr. Lee Wisher of the Woods Hole Group, who, who is on Zoom here, I believe, because um, he's out of town, but he said he would connect in by Zoom, and he confirmed the findings from the InterScience report. Dr. Wisher provided a separate report on the shoreline stability for this property because there's some question about the shoreline and the dunes relative to the Dolliver line. And the Woods Hole Group provided response to the applicable sections of the Nelson Pope and Voorhees report addressing some of the surprising standards um, that were in the review, but they're not in the code. Uh, my office prepared a response to the Nelson Pope and Voorhees report, along with some updating of diagrams. We provided a drawing showing the positioning of the structures in relation to the adjacent properties, the demonstrating that were consistent with the character of the neighborhood and that were respectful and not impactful to our neighbors. And you'd previously received letters from the two neighbors on either side that supported this project. We submitted the conforming building envelope plan. We had presented that at an earlier meeting, but it never got into the record, so that is now part of the record. You received a detailed memorandum from Bennett and Reed that responded to and addressed the Nelson Pope and Voorhees memo. Um, and their memorandum also speaks to other projects reviewed by the village and the consistency of this project with prior actions of this board. And then there was a Meadow Lane neighborhood analysis that contained decisions and surveys of other properties that have been before this board. I believe that if you examine this project in the context of the environmental improvements and the other projects uh, that the board has reviewed, your prior long-standing actions on similar applications, I think you'll find that this project is consistent with those decisions and worthy of an approval. This project has considerable environmental benefits. It substantially improves setbacks to wetlands. It locates all structures behind the coastal erosion hazard line. All structures meet the setback um, from the Dolliver line that was previously approved by this board. The proposed improvements are more than 330 feet from the crest of the first rank of Ocean Beach Dunes, which is a standard that's used by over 80% of this village, even though we are in the Dolliver line. We recognize that. The plan contains significant setback improvements for the sanitary system and improves the technology. The residents will be FEMA compliant where this current residence is not. And that's something that's encouraged by both the village and the federal policies. The existing house exceeds the maximum height that's allowed in the village and the, current, the proposed house will conform. This plan removes non-native landscape vegetation and restores the entirety of the property with native coastal dune land and wetland habitat. You don't see that very often in applications that come before this board. It will remove New York State designated invasive species and improve the diversity and habitat on this site. The plan increases the size of the existing recorded conservation easement that encompasses the wetlands and will actually go over a larger area to provide better protection. Stormwater runoff and drainage control is being provided at at least a minimum of two inches of storage and even greater capacity in some areas where no runoff control exists at the present time. And the design has been 
reduce, it reduces coverage within 125 and 150 foot setback. We've also demonstrated to you that the Dolliver line, while contained in the code, we believe is a relic, um, given all the information that you have. This application has gone on for a long time, and, it's, and throughout the process, we've been responsive to your requests. You've had an extensive record to consider, and this, this is the, the submission that we made back to you. It's extensive, and um, I know it only came in about 10 days ago, so you probably haven't had a chance to review it. Um, but we're probably as exhausted by this as you are. Um, but we had really no choice given the memo that was submitted to actually provide this extensive response to you. So the entire project team is here. Um, you know, John Bennett's here to prepare to make a legal presentation on the project. Lee Wisher's here on Zoom. The architect, the landscape architect are here. However, we learned um, last week that two of the board members are actually are, are gonna be leaving the board. There are gonna be two other people that are gonna be here. Um, so we think um, in fairness to the applicant and to the two new board members that are coming in, we would ask that this matter be adjourned to your July meeting. Um, this way they have the opportunity to actually understand the project, ask us questions um, that they may have on the project. Um, so we would ask that this be moved to the next, next meeting. So Brian, I, I have some questions for I guess you and, and Chick because I think, I think the board is looking at this project in a in, in, in a different way than the applicant. Um, the applicant is comparing what's there to the new project and making an argument that what their new project will be is better than what's there. When I'm reading the wetlands um, provisions of, of our village zoning code, that's not the standard. The standard is whether the project achieves the maximum feasible setback from the wetlands. So when I'm listening to your changes now, okay, I'm seeing it differently. I'm mm -hmm. seeing that your prior proposal did not achieve the maximum feasible setback and that you're actually conceding that now because you changed the project to improve, let me finish, to improve the wetland setbacks, to increase them. So the prior project that you presented is was not maximizing the feasible setback. I think, but, I, but, but let me finish go because, ahead, go because ahead. I think we're looking at it just from different angles. So mm -hmm. I'm looking at this, and, and legal counsel and, and, and environmental counsel want to correct my perspective. I'm looking at this as if it is a vacant piece of land. It's how the board looks at <clears throat> many other projects, okay? Everything on this property, except for the tennis court, is being scraped. So now you're looking at a vacant piece of land, and I thought, reading the code, that the standard would be, does this project achieve the maximum feasible setback? And to my mind, no. It could be smaller, you could remove the tennis court. There's a lot of things that you could do to achieve a maximum feasible setback from the wetlands. Your standard seems to be that the new house is better than the old house, which was approved years ago when we knew less. You know, we were you know less concerned about what was going on with um, uh, development. Mm -hmm. People were less likely to build larger. It's a whole different world now than when this house was originally approved for construction. But that's not to say that we should be following a standard which is simply it's better than what's there so i just need legal counsel and environmental counsel i mean truly i can i can agree with with rich that it's better than what's there but i'm not seeing that as our standard i'll just interject one thing just recognize that what we have on the property is legal and has a certificate of occupancy so i do think that it's important that you consider what is there as opposed to this is a completely clean site because they could walk away and leave everything that's there the way it is with the sanitary system, 89 feet from wetlands, and you don't get any of the environmental benefits. And I think that that's something that should go into the decision-making process. I don't it, think you'd it consider it as a, as a scraped site. Process. I'm not, I'm not I don't disagreeing with you. <coughs> I'm trying to follow the code. And when I read the code, and again, I, let's pause and, and have legal counsel, yep. environmental counsel guide us. Because, and when I read the environmental consultant's report, he used the standard 
that the project does not achieve the maximum feasible setback from the wetlands. But you're not talking about that. You're not, you're not addressing that standard. You're not looking at this and saying, we're showing you that there is no other house or no other development project that could um, achieve a, a better setback from the wetlands than what we have. And in fact, you've just shown tonight a better project than what was previously presented. So I'm just getting confused. I, I, I think, what, I think what that shows you is this applicant has been trying to work with this board as we have all along. As you've asked us to make modifications, we've made modifications. We have changed this project a number of times at considerable cost to this owner to try to address this board. We haven't come in here like a bull in a china shop and banged our fists and say, this is what we demand. We've been working with you to try to change this to address the concerns. And, and everywhere, and I, everywhere and we that, can, that's why, we've made that's changes. That's why I think the, the problem that we're having is you're addressing a different standard. So I just need clarification from our legal okay. counsel and our let consultant. Me, let me speak to that. You know. Know. Well, Mark, really, the, the hold, standard. Hold on. Let, no, no, let no, no, no. You're talking. You made a I'm statement asking, about a legal standard, and I want to respond to it. Counsel and our well, I want to respond to your standard because it's standards. fanciful. I don't want to hear. Oh, you don't want to hear it? No, it's my right now. record. I, would like to I hear get it. to put it in, Mark. So you made a not statement, now. Mr. Bennett. When your turn comes, the chair controls the floor. We're making the application. It's Mr. Chair. chair. He made. He made a legal argument, and I'm trying to respond to it. And you will in due course. Please ask could, because please you're try. making it out of whole cloth. Okay, what is our legal standard, Brian? Your legal standard is based on the site, so you are looking at the at the um, various factors based on the site itself, not on what is there now and what, what you're changing it to. It is a factor, and it's something to consider. But ultimately, the way this reads is that you have to look at it in respect of the various policies that are in place with respect <laughs> to environmental protections, that's your standard. As uh, Richard had said correctly, you should also consider as part of that uh, the improvement on the site. But it's not, it's not the underlying standard, but it is something to consider. So, so what is our underlying standard? Nineteen point four D and E. Yeah, <clears throat> keep going back. Keep going up and down. Uh, Alex, are the changes so captured? You have, the, um, you have se several standards the, to look it at. Was not rewritten. For, for issuance of a permit yeah. under 19, 116, 19, you have several standards. One, that the proposed activity will be in accord with the policies and provisions of the zoning chapter. Two, uh, as applicable uh, in applying in applying those standards, the effects of the proposed activity must be considered regardless of political boundaries. I guess that means uh, municipal boundaries. And then the last part of it uh, would be in granting, denying, or limiting a permit, the board considers the effect of the proposed activity with reference to the public health, safety and welfare, fish and wildlife, flood, hurricane, storm dangers, and the protection or enhancement of the several functions of the wetlands and the benefits derived therefrom as set forth in the zoning chapter, again, irrespective of municipal boundaries. No permit shall issue which would have a substantial adverse impact on the public health, safety, and welfare or the protection or enhancement of these several functions of wetlands and the benefits derived from them as set forth in the zoning code. There are a few other uh, considerations. In, in looking at it, you shall seek to achieve the maximum feasible setback from wetlands for building structures, septic tanks, pools, and dry wells. I think that's something you referenced before. Well, I'm, uh, I'm referencing the, our environmental consultants report. That was right. the standard being used. I'm seeing a difference in the standards being used. Okay. Um, so that, that's generally it. There are a couple of other minor ones, but those are the primary considerations and the factors that you would consider in determining whether to grant uh, or deny or grant with modifications a proposed wetlands permit. So I guess the question is um, the request that I made to have this postponed to the July 25th meeting in as much as you are not going to be sitting here at the, in the July meeting because you've submitted your letter of resignation to the Board of Trustees that was accepted on the 25th. 
you know, two days ago. So I guess the question is, how does this board feel about allowing us to present this to the board members that actually will be here to vote? The code's not going to change in, in, in that time period. Yeah, so yeah. what I'm trying to put on the record right now is a difference between the standard that you're presenting. But you won't be sitting the, here. For, you won't be standard. sitting here to evaluate that standard when the, when this this matter is going to be decided. So I'd rather have the discussion with the people that actually are going to be sitting here. I think that's fair the, for the, the applicant, and it's also fair for the members that are going to be sitting in those chairs that you're sitting in. I think that's fair, and I would hope that the board would find that fair, that we would have the ability to come back and present to the people that are going to decide this case as opposed to having this esoteric discussion right now when you're going to walk out of the room and you're not going to be back here. I, I don't think the board's decided whether to decide tonight or not decide tonight, so I appreciate uh, your comments. Well, 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 Okay. Can we can we hear from you, Chick, about the standards to be applied? Uh, sure. Ryan went through them accurately, in my opinion. Um, I'll just say that to me, it's both of those factors. One is uh, to ensure that you consider the effect of the activity, um, public health, safety, welfare, fish and wildlife, flood, hurricane. Everything Brian said before is in 116-19.4D. And to me, that's the argument that the applicant is making, that it won't affect those, and in fact, it will re result in some improvements. And I believe that's true. I think you indicated mm -hmm. that. Certainly, the applicant has put that on the record. Uh, the second part of it is the approving authority shall seek to maximize uh, the setbacks, and it identifies each of those areas. For uh, building structures, septic systems, pools, dry wells, roads, driveways, fertilized vegetation, uh, which would ensure wetlands protection and meet all other standards. So that's the one that says maximum feasible setback. Um, I do feel that council may be best to weigh in on, you know, the metric or the benchmark as to, you know, whether it's a vacant property or we're looking at the existing conditions because that uh, does have legal implications. Um, but the, the standards that I see are very clear. Uh, don't affect the wetlands, don't impact those systems, and achieve maximum feasible setbacks for all those things. But so that, that's not how both. The... It's part of uh, the weighing process that you have to consider, and uh, all of this is part of the record. But that's not how this board has acted in the past. When you look at all, all the decisions this board has reviewed, and we've submitted a, an extensive document that includes a lot of those decisions, we still have four requests into the building department to look at another 10 records of applications. But that's not how you've acted in the past. So you know, I think that one of the things this board also has to consider is what's the history this board has looked at in terms of other applications. You have looked at the conditions of the property. You've looked at the improvements on the property, and you weighed those in the decision-making process. You don't look at it as a scraped site. That's not what you've done in the past, including applications that you, the chairman, have voted on. 1990, by the way. Take a look at that decision. Look at what happened there. The, the wetlands variances and the, the Dolliver Line variances that were granted in 1990 that you were on, sat on this board and you voted for approval for are very similar to what we've asked for here. And there's not a 47-page report from Nelson Pope and Voice. In fact, there's not a report in that application <coughs> at all. There was a big difference between that development and this development, though, wasn't there? The, when you look at the relief that's been asked, it's very similar to what's been asked here. Right. But they didn't have a tennis court. And when board member Luke Farron asked you, would this applicant remove the tennis court, it was dismissed out of hand. Let me but that applicant, Let me right, right now, truly, by the way, just could we have one or the other well, who's presenting. Legal counsel. I'm legal yeah, but, but it's, it's, a little, it's a little much to have but, both but I'd, I'd, I'd ask the board at the same time. What's, what's the consideration or request to go to the July 25th? Because I think that that's fair to the applicant, and I think it's fair to the board. No, it, it's up for discussion. So, so the can, can, uh, if not, we'll, we'll present the entire case, because we have a lot more to say, but we just figured <clears> it's probably not appropriate if you guys aren't going to be here. It's up to... Can we get Joyce back? You guys can decide what you want to do if you want to postpone it. I just wanted to highlight the standards to be applied. Let's get Joyce back. I'm sure she's here. I'm sorry, I'm here. here. I'm here. Mm -hmm. 
so the question is whether we want to postpone this until July 25th when um, Julie and I will no longer be on the board and um, I guess they may have new board members um, or if we want to try to close this decision tonight it's up to you guys I was I was just for the record highlighting that part of the problem here was a difference in I believe the way we were looking at this application and the way the applicant was looking at it I believe the applicant was was placing a great deal of weight on the fact that um, what they were presenting the new project would be better than what's there and when I read our environmental consultants report it seemed to lean more strongly in favor of looking at this project as does it or does it not maximize wetland setbacks and those are to me those are somewhat related concepts but still different so it's really up to you and and Tom and Luke if you want to postpone it or try to finalize this tonight I I have no issue with us postponing it to the next meeting when we have our two new board members with us Thank you. There's a lot of new material. You know, I don't, there, there's a lot to go through. I don't have a strong opinion one way or another. If you wanted to make a motion to vote, you're the, you're the chairman. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if, you, if your intention is to vote on this application tonight, um, we have a lot more to say. A lot more to say. I just thought that it would make more sense for us to, to have that discussion with people that are actually going to vote. I think it's more practical to adjourn it okay, to so the next meeting, but I would point out that you're taking the risk that there are only three members. Well, then we, we, we may well, we'll ask, we'll ask. Take that as a compass. Okay. Yeah, we may, I would, but that is a business risk. Yeah. Well, well, but, we'll take it as a cunt because we may seek a third of the adjourn because as far as I read the here, it's law. I'm entitled to a vote. <laughs> I'm sorry. We'll take that risk as it comes. Um, we know there's been discussions about identifying new members, and there's certainly been a, a determination as to the new chairman. We'll take that risk as it comes. My understanding, just so the council is aware of it and everyone's aware of it, is that we are entitled to a, a vote of the entire board. Um, however, I th my sense, based upon discussions with the uh, uh, village uh, officials and trustees is that the board uh, intends to act expeditiously to fill the two seats. Okay, so I'll motion to adjourn for all purposes until the next scheduled public hearing, which was, was it July 25th. Um, uh, case number 3155-1750, Waterview LLC, 1750 Metal Link. Can I have a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. So, Thank you very much. Sure. We can move on to case number 3151, Alexander D. Pisa, 213 Windmill Lane. Brian Bennett. Affidavits of John Bennett. Oh, I go ahead. want to co confirm receipt of the Sorry. affidavit of posting, which is now filed. So uh, it's been a it's been a while. So let me run through this with you. This is located on a right of way uh, off of Windmill Lane. It's a currently existing two-family residence with a certificate of occupancy uh, for such. Um, the the uh, request for relief, which is reposted and renoticed and mailed, included the old request for relief. It didn't take into account the fact that the uh, building inspector had re-examined this as per our request and found, based upon the language of the code and based upon the uh, records of the real property tax services in Suffolk County, which is, creates the tax maps, and based upon uh, other usage in the village, including but not limited to uh, some other areas, for example, uh, the Fairley uh, uh, Road, that the setback should be taken from the southerly line of the easement, uh, which is the property line. So what that does is it, um, it significantly reduces the any front yard relief that's required. And also, um, as the, as the um, application properly noticed, 
Um, the lot is 8,263 square feet in size, which includes the portion of the lot that is burdened by the right-of-way. Really what you're looking at here, and, and by the way, it's very important to note, this is, this is really critical for the way you have to properly analyze this. Uh, the Southampton Village Code does, uh, has an interesting thing in it. It says a two-family, uh, an, uh, an existing two-family residence, uh, and a one-family residence for that matter, uh, in the village is a, is, a, is a permitted use. So this is not a non-conforming use, uh, even, though, even though it's in an OD zone. It says, it's, it's like people scratch their head at that all the time. They would think, oh, you'd think that would be a pre-existing non-conforming uh, structure put to a non-conforming use. But the code actually says an existing one or two-family house is, is a, uh, is a uh, conforming use. And what that does uh, is it kicks in, and it's really super important to understand this. What it does is it kicks in section 1169C. Uh, uh, 1169? 1169? See, 1169? 19. 19, thank you, Kelly. 11619, which says that a pre existing non conforming uh, structure put to a conforming use, which is that what we have here. Follow me because I'm sort of nerdy when I read these codes because that's what I do for a living. But a pre existing non conforming uh, 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 structure put to a conforming use, you can rebuild it in full, in kind, as long as you don't increase the degree of nonconformity. So most of the things that you have in front of you uh, are, uh, we've tried to stay within, and it's demonstrated on the plot plan, we've tried to stay within generally, but not fully, we've tried to stay within the, um, the, the footprint of the, of the, um, of the existing uh, structure. Just let me get that for you. I had some, I had some notes on that. Billy, do you have that? I had my sort of a cheat sheet in the, uh, that I was being able to refer to, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Let's see. You know, remember I had one with had about my. No, it had my. Oh, here we go. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. And it's helpful to look at this on the diagram. The, th the three-part sheet that's been provided by the surveyor. <laughs> so um, the existing uh, front yard. Can we it, put that on the front camera? camera? Oh, yeah. Sure. The problem is that to, to read it, I have to have it like this. But I think it doesn't matter because it's just too sharp. And can you turn the mic, please? Oh, sure. You can use this one. Too. Oh, thanks, Chip. The existing. Uh, front yard um, is 23.3 uh, feet from the southerly line of, of the uh, of the property and our proposal is at 23.5 you see this box here this box here which is the is the as the as a hashed diagonally hash box is the existing there's the footprint of the existing structure put over the proposed structure so you see how the large majority of it um, stays within the footprint of the existing structure. Thus, um, is uh, is under one sixteen nineteen C. We're rebuilding this existing conforming structure. The, there are some areas where we don't stay within that setback, and uh, that's what we tried to do with that, with the exception of this second story overhang, which nevertheless stays behind the pre-existing 23.5 uh, foot front yard setback. We tried to put that in a conforming area, which is a 30 foot setback. You'll see on this piece right here, we're within the 30, 30 foot required side yard setback. So as it relates to side yards, the only thing we either are building along a pre-existing side, side, side setback which under the code we can, as a matter of right, rebuild this conforming structure, non-conforming structure put to a conforming use. There's two exceptions. One is there's a little um, cellar entrance here now, a Bilco door entrance. What we want to do is not an, as very common these days. We, we have a proposed cellar entrance. Uh, if this was a conforming setback, we wouldn't need relief for it. But since the setback is only 10 feet, we need relief for about five feet for this proposed cellar entrance, but it is subterranean and it doesn't, 
create the typical reasons for side yards, which are to preserve uh, light and air. So that's over on the, on the easterly side. As it relates to the westerly side, our addition conforms uh, in full to the 30-foot side yard setback requirements. And with the exception of this little second story overhang, which again is well behind the existing uh, setback of the property, this all conforms to the, th this all, excuse me, this all con conforms to the 30-foot side yard requirement. But we don't meet the aggregate side yard relief because you have the 30 foot here and the 10 feet here. So we're at 40 as opposed to the required 60, but the minimum side yard request on the westerly side is met. And this is a vacant lot. Uh, I don't know, it's about 5,000 square feet. The title is sort of a, hard to figure out. Um, we can't, we, we don't really actually know who um, owns that. Um, it, some uh, dispersed airs, it appears, but nevertheless, it is vacant. Uh, but so, it, but we not in terms of encroachment on that uh, uh, westerly, easterly, excuse me, side yard. We're not getting any closer with anything that isn't uh, subterranean. Again, that's just the the, um, the cellar entrance. So, what we've tried to do again is we've tried to put a house that conforms to the pre-existing non-conforming setbacks. And again, the good thing under 116.19 is that it, since it's we're by luck, it's a it's a it's a permitted use. We can rebuild it in kind uh, as long as we don't uh, impact uh, increase the degree of nonconformity. So the only places where we are pushing out are areas generally, with the exception of second overhang, where we're within the existing 30 foot setback. So we're not increasing the nonconformity there. We're increasing the nonconformity in terms of side yard solely as it relates to aggregate side yards. Similarly, in the rear yard, we can build along that pre-existing non-conforming setback. Uh, the existing setback uh, is 22.3. We're proposed 22.4. So we've tried to be very, 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 very responsive and build this as much as we can within uh, the existing, taking advantage of the existing uh, code setbacks. So again, Mr. Talbot gave us the revised determination. Unfortunately, this letter request the notice was published in the paper as the application was originally filed, but th that's okay because the notice John, actually included. Microphone. I'm sorry, the notice actually included more relief. Again, an existing two family <laughs> residence, the copy of the CO was included with the application package. Now, this is, this, as far as I'm concerned, is, is, is it wins the day. The code uh, requires 20,000 square feet per use. This is a currently a pre existing two-family house, uh, which is 40,000 square feet of density. Uh, we're going to take this down to 20,000 square feet. And to the extent that the code requires 20,000 square feet per unit, uh, that's a massive reduce, reduction in the, in the, uh, the nonconformity. We're actually taking this down. And let me talk a little bit about parking. Um, I've sort of been candidly um, uh, bemused by concerns about parking by one of the neighbors, um, the, 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 a parking for a single family residence is um, you take the number of bedrooms and you, and you take off the space, which gives us to three spaces, or, or, and the building inspector has conformed this, three spaces per, uh, for this single family, proposed single family residence. The two family house is four spaces. And the other thing that the board should be aware of, uh, and again, I can hand this out if you want it, but if you, I didn't get it into you before the time period, but you can take notice of this because it's something that's in every engineer's um, um, bookshelf. There's something called the ITE rate manual, which calculates rates for all different types of properties. Uh, and the latest one, uh, the residential properties, a single family residence is approximately 9.57 trips per day. That's in and out. That's what a single family residence does. Uh, a two family residence, that's twice the number of trips, has twice the number of trips. So instead of 9.57, it's two times 9.57. It's almost 20 tips, trips in and out. That's just the way the IT manuals uh, work. And, and the manuals are based upon, uh, you know, in, in the field trip counts. And, and the engineers put them into this as, as Luke 
well knows. So if we're going to uh, go from a one-family house, I'd rather strike that a two-family house to a one-family house, we're reducing the number of, of trips in and out of the property uh, by 9.57. And again, we, we're sort of scratching our head as to why that would be anything other than something that would, the neighborhood would support. Uh, we do have some letters of support, although there's one neighbor who's concerned about things. But again, I'm quite trying to point out the fact that those concerns are really just generalized uh, uh, complaints, as the case law says. Actually, the facts on the ground are such that if anyone was concerned about traffic impact, a reduction from two, a two-family house to a one-family house is something that should be welcomed. Um, so really what this is about, and, and again, and, and not only that, uh, it, it's a very, very minor request in terms of uh, enlargement. 384 square feet of additional habitable space is what we want here. 384 square What is that? I think it, is, is that half this room, maybe? I don't know. It's not that much. Um, maybe two-thirds. Maybe two-thirds. Um, but that's in exchange for a significant reduction uh, of density uh, on the property. Now, um, when we first came in, um, the house was about 500 square feet larger. And uh, Luke said, you know, I know there's no uh, GFA in the OD zone, but could you try to get a little bit closer to what it would be from uh, the GFA formula if this was a residential lot? So. We didn't get there all the way because we didn't think that was quite fair because after all, we are reducing the density. We are going to build the house current, pursuant to current standards. And I don't think anybody can ask anybody who's going to come in and rebuild a house not to gain some sort of square footage. That's just what happens and what's fair and what this board has uh, recognized. But it's a very minimum s square footage increase in an area where you don't have a GFA uh, 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 limitation. We, 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 we listened uh, and, and we tried to do something about that. I'll give you the actual numbers. The original GFA, uh, uh, and again, even though in, this is an area where you don't have GFA, the question was asked, was 2,838 square feet. We're down to 2,422 square feet. So we're tr we tried to be consistent with uh, just being listening and trying to ma maintain a reasonable standard. Again, we talked about the reduction in density. It'll be no closer to the front or rear property lines than the existing residents. And that section 116.19 is very important in terms of helping us greatly with that. The front, exists, front yard exists at 23.3 feet. Uh, the proposed front is 23.5. The rear exists at 22.3. And we're proposed a rear yard at 22.4. And again, I, I will say this time and time again because it's a real saver for this application. This is a conforming use, and pursuant to the village code, the entire building can be re reconstructed to this non-conforming setback. It's only really the addition, because of the addition to the west, that we run afoul not of the minimum setback, but of the aggregate set yard setback. But that's been established by the, by the house, and we have the right to rebuild that. So again, relief from side yard and combined side yard is requested, but only and it really, as it relates to the side yard to the east for that cellar entrance, which again is subterranean and doesn't impact the typical need for the typical rationale for side yards, which are preserving of light and air with the neighbors, uh, and, um, and only for aggregate side yard. Typically, if you can meet um, the uh, minimum side yard uh, and you have an existing established side yard, which you have the ability to construct, do boards tend to be uh, understanding with that. And again, that's, that side yard to the east is only for the construction of a staircase for the basement. Uh, we ha it's a non-conforming lot and proved by uh, two family residents that's non-conforming. Uh, that's uh, going to a one family house. Uh, I, I, again, sort of scratching my head, that's a, a massive, massive, massive uh, response to what the uh, village code uh, seeks. Um, and again, we're, we're conforming with this. We also submitted a copy of the special permit issued by this board in connection with the structure at 74 White Street, where this board granted approval to convert an existing office building. That uh, used to be Eric Woodward's office. It was that, I, I remember that office, uh, that building very, very well. My, 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 my family's uh, construction 
uh, 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 you know, building and now my, my law office being uh, directly to the north. And that was, a, that was for, for a long time, that was a single family residence. You look at it, it's, it was built that way. And then Eric Woodward converted it to office. Uh, and then slowly it was given an approval for one unit. Uh, and this board very recently um, allowed two units to happen there. You gave it a density um, um, uh, relief. We're actually reducing the density. <clears throat> So, from a density point of view, this is a, is a, is a the, 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 there was a much more significant variance, much, much, much more significant variance that was given at 74 White Street, which again, I think in the 90s had been converted to an office use. So, you let them go from where they abandon the residential uses, which would have had a 20,000 per density requirement. They abandoned that when they came into the office. You let them come back in, not only with just one unit of density, but twice, which are much more significant, uh, much more significant uh, variance. This, air, this area has received many approvals for single family homes, some on vacant lots that, where there, one, there weren't any. Uh, here we have an inherent uh, reduction. You ha you, the board approved single family homes uh, for 80 White Street, 76 White Street, 75 White Street, and six, 73 White Streets, all residences that have uh, received approval from this board. Uh, we submitted letters from Mr. Janke, who's the co owner of 2005B, and Sheila Eccleson, 211 Windmill Lane, both in support of the application. Uh, I'll go through quickly the standards for special exceptions, which we meet handily. I'm again scratching my head. I don't know why I have to make an application for a single family residence when I already have a, two, a single two-story residence, but mm, if that's the, what the building inspector wants me to show, that's fine. So it'll promote the general intents and uses and purposes of the chapter, we are, or and again, there's already a two-family dwelling, the adjacent parcel to the immediate west and the property to the north, fronting on room lane are improved by single family residents, thus the established character is residential and the proposed use is the most appropriate use. Uh, by the way, uh, there's, it's not without reason that uh, the, oh, and, and before I forget, you know, a special exception, which again, I don't really think I need here, but I, I handily meet it. A special exception is, is, is not a variance. I'm sure in the courses that you took before you became members of the boards, they told you what the difference is. A special exception uh, is a use where there has been a finding by the, uh, the municipality that, um, that, and I'll quote you from Terry Rice's commentary to the town law and the village law, uh, which Mr. Stoller is, like all of us lawyers, have read extensively. That's a legislative finding that such a use is in harmony with the community's general zoning plan and will not adversely affect the neighborhood. Um, so a, a special exception is not like a variance. Again, I don't know why we need a special exception here to establish something that's of less density than what already exists, but nevertheless, we'll go through the standards. I think I already did this, but I'll go through it again because it's been a while. Um, the plot area is sufficient. That's a no-brainer. We're reducing the density from two-family residence to a single-family home. Will not prevent the orderly and, or, orderly and reasonable use of adjacent properties. Again, already improved by a two-family dwelling. The adjacent parcel to the immediate west and the property to the north, fronting on Windmill Lane, are improved by single-family residences. Uh, it's, it's particularly suitable for the location. It is. It's surrounded by single-family residences, and obviously the use is therefore particularly suitable. And it is, of course, as a special exception use, something that the legislative body has found to be generally in harmony uh, with the area. Then, there, remember, these are, very, these are general uh, standards that are used for commercial uses as well. Uh, so uh, the proposed use is residential, and it's not unsuitably near a church, school, theater, or recreational area. Those are the type of commercial uses that you have to meet with that standard again, but you don't have that same concern with a single family residence. It's a non-usance non industry. It conforms with the chapter de definition of a special exception use. Uh, access facilities are more than appropriate. As a matter of fact, we're gonna cut down on the amount of trip generation by its very nature reducing it from a two-story, a two-family to a one-family. Um, there is a proposed, we need, we need, there's an existing area of parking. We're proposing a parking space at 
a zero lot line that's already in the area where parking exists. That brings us to four. And I'm, uh, that's really up to the board. Uh, three, Wait, it brings us to four what? Parking? Four parking, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, four parking spaces. That brings us up to four. We only need three, but the, Wait, one of the neighbors- have, It says there's zero offset. From yes, it. because what the one of the spaces- So the if somebody's parking like a foot not in the parking space, their bumper is going to block no, this no, it's rather a, narrow right of No, no, no. It's zero offset to the side yard. Side oh. yard relief, Tom. I'm glad you pointed that out. Thank you. We're sort of agnostic about that, about that other space uh, uh, in the side yard. Uh, we can, if we remove that. Wait, but all four are in the side, just one? No, just one. Just one. All the other so parking. the three that are near the road, if somebody parks like a foot not far in enough, they're going to be blocking that rather narrow right of way. That would be my concern if I live, and it was a concern expressed. But but that exists. By neighbors. But that exists now. I have the space for a conforming area, as confirmed by the building inspector, for three parking spaces, which is what the code requires. And I added the fourth because I was trying to be responsive to the neighbors' neighbors' concern because they wanted to. <coughs> mitigate the possibility that someone would be parking not on site right. but but in the road so that's why I, and i need a zero lot line setback not not pushing into the right of way i can't do that i can't block the right of way and you can't you know um but i'm we're totally agnostic about that if you don't want to grant that relief for the extra space that's fine it was only in response to uh, the concern of the neighbor uh, that that someone would be parking in, in, in the right of way. You did have uh, testimony from the co-owner of, of the property that there has never been uh, a, a, a problem there. And I, again, I, I drive by that every day and I, I do not ever remember seeing anyone parked in the right of way. And, and, and so, but again, bless you, we tried to mitigate that by providing another space, thus the request for the side yard set back. But again, think about it. It's only logical. If you have a two-story residence, how many, well, <laughs> it's gonna be more likely, I'm sorry, two-family residence, your code tells you it's more likely that there are gonna be more people parked there. That's again, the thing why, again, scratching my head, I don't understand why this isn't being welcomed by everyone in the, in the neighborhood. So we, re we proposed Parking in excess of what is required by the code by adding four spaces and having four, four spaces instead of one. I think it's a good idea, but if the board doesn't like that request for relief, again, we're agnostic. Um, adequate buffers have been provided. If the board wants us to screen anything else, we'll be more than happy to do that. Adequate provision for, for storm water. Again, I'm just clocking through the uh, special exception standards. Sort of silly here, these are very broad standards. There's no outdoor sales lot or rental equipment storage or display areas. It's a residence. Uh, and there are no further specific conditions and safeguards required for this use under 116.23. Um, so that's where we are. Um, I think it's a great application. I think it does the sort of stuff that the, um, that the code tells you to do. It says that you try to bring things more into conformity to the code, which by reducing uh, from a two-family house to one family, that should win the day, but uh, we've done even more than that. That's all really I have to say, unless the board has any questions. Does anybody have any questions? No questions. Can I motion to close? Unless, I think anybody, you might have a neighbor uh, here. So I will motion to close the, um, the hearing for case number 3151, Alexander D. Pisa, 213 Windmill Lane. Can I have a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Brian, I think I think you already prepared a draft decision. A couple. On this one. Decide which way you want to go. You draft you have a decision drafted. Excuse me. We we just closed the hearing. Know, but so the, the hearing's closed. Decisions. decisions. Specifically. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Do you want us to discuss or you have to.
Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So we have been hearing this case for some time. The ap initial application was stamped received October 6th, 2023. And the zoning denial level letter was actually dated 8 17 23. Um, and the zone <clears throat> denial letter, of course, set forth numerous reasons for a denial of a building permit. Um, the applicant requests variances from the zoning code for non-compliance with front yard, rear yard, and side yard setbacks. I would propose that we deny the variances because granting the variances would cause a potential detrimental effect to the health, safety, and general welfare <clears throat> excuse me, of the neighborhood that outweighs any benefit to be realized by the applicant. Granting the variances would allow the expansion of the size of a residence very close to an active vehicular thoroughfare, allow the proposed construction of a highly non-conforming structure, and could be used as a precedent for granting similar variances for the development of a similarly situated vacant lot next door. Ultimately, the potential detriment to the neighborhood includes the potential negative effect upon the historic church at the entrance to this road. The primary reason for the need for the variances is simply that the property is less than one-fifth of an acre and cannot accommodate the residence the applicant proposes. Regarding the request for a special exception use, Section 116-22 states, for every such special exception use, the Board of Appeals shall determine that the plot area is sufficient, appropriate, and adequate for the use and the reasonably anticipated operation and expansion thereof. The need for a multitude of variances is evidence that the <laughs> plot area is not sufficient for the expansion proposed by this application and therefore fails to meet the test for a special exception use. So that's my view of, of this application, which we've been hearing for a long time. We extended the hearing awaiting uh, a determination by the new building inspector, but I'm open to everybody else's view, but that's my view. There you go. Okay, well, you. taking it one by one, um, special exemption use. I agree with the applicant that um, Allowing a, a single family home here is appropriate. I think that it's a street with single family homes. And I think a uh, two family home is actually out of character now. So notwithstanding the, the variances, the area variances, I'd be in favor of the special exemption use. That's kind of academic, right? If we're going to deny the, um, the area requests, but I, also, I do think that the applicant did a good job of showing that uh, much of the proposal is in line with existing structure on the house. Um, we talk a lot about treating a property as an empty lot or an existing structure. They are essentially rebuilding in place much of this. Um, and that's where some of these area requests come from, is just to rebuild what is already there. Am I am I right on that, Alex? I'm sorry, you're talking about the, the area uh, really? Like the side yard setback on the um, on the north side and the east side, right? Those are existing boundaries of the existing structure. They're they're very similar to what's existing. The right. denial letter is written based on the required setbacks in right. the OD zone. Right. Right. Um, so while I would not be in favor of these were this an empty lot. Uh, I'm sympathetic to the fact that they're staying very much in line with the, uh, the existing structure that's there. I don't love the, um, the request for the reduction of the total required setback, but taken as a whole, um, I'm in favor of granting the variance for this property. All, all of the references. I would, I would approve all of them. Um, to go a little bit further, I, I hear your concern about the lot next door. 
were a project proposed there that needed the exact same variances, that would get a deny a, a move to deny from me because that's new construction on an empty lot. The, the differentiating, differentiating factor here for me is that we do have an existing structure there, which they are largely rebuilding in kind. But they're expanding. They're expanding. Three, at, at, 384 at, at feet larger, right? I mean, that's, that's two <clears throat> bedrooms. Um, I do. No, but they're three. expanding the nonconformity. So if the applicant, if somebody came forward on the vacant lot, and that was your argument against, okay, they would say, but it's consistent with the character of the community. You granted variances for the property next door. Yeah. So now the character of the community is that this zoning board allows this front yard setback, allows this front yard setback only 23.5 feet from an active thoroughfare. So when they come in and ask for a brand new construction <clears throat> saying, hey, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to match the front yard setback 23.5 feet, I just think you're putting the board possibly right. into a situation where they will say, I'm a similarly situated property. You need to grant the same 23.5 foot relief from this thoroughfare. Well, I think that I hear you. Um, I think that if we're talking about neighborhood character and talking about just as uh, windmill lane as the neighborhood, because in that this area of the village, neighborhood is really street by street, um, then this density already exists on the street and is appropriate. Oh, I, I didn't talk about the density. I'm talking about the front yard setback. Well, no, no that's what the I mean. The idea like, of the, having the extents, a house that's at most 23.5 feet, and I still, I don't agree with, I, I agree with Tian Ho So. Right. Okay. I think this is a private road and the measurement Still, despite what the new building inspector says, okay, um, I still don't see this as an easement. Okay, can't do that. There wasn't a document filed that shows that there's an easement. This was revised. Okay, right. So I'm still seeing this as, and I use my terms, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> carefully. Okay, I don't want to get too caught up in whether this is a private road or what exactly the vernacular or the the proper term is for this. It's an active thoroughfare. And this house is five feet from that active thoroughfare. If you drive up there, right. cars going back and forth, the neighbors trying to leave, okay, you are passing, your car is passing five feet from the front of this house. Right. And you're saying, let's let it expand further. So it's not just a small portion of the house that's five feet. Okay. It's a wider portion, and that concerns me. As far as a neighborhood goes, I don't know any other neighborhood in the village where you have active traffic going that close to the front of a house in the village. <clears throat> okay, so devil's advocate on that. Um, it's not a through fare, right? It's a, because you can't leave from it. So uh, okay. it's not as so if I, I'm it's, trying not to. Okay. It's, yeah. it's an active road. Call it, I, I don't know what exact terminologies are going to be acceptable to everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cars pass up and down. Right. But it's not as if uh, someone who doesn't live on that street or isn't going specifically to one of those houses, it's not like you're cutting through there to get no, to no, your No, no, but there's the visitors and there's, there's people coming and going. And there's right. a lot of traffic. Well, there's not as much traffic as, you know, the street uh, adjacent to it, right? Where yeah. you're in the street parallel to it, to the north, John's office street. <laughs> Um, in terms of... But we the, certainly the, heard a great deal from the neighbors over the course of all of the months of testimony about right. how this was a hardship, regardless of the determinations of the building inspector. Uh, but we heard very clearly from the neighbors that this would, this would change how they lived in their homes. There was... There was one person who, there was one of the families that uh, wrote in about it, and there was a dispute between two people who owned one property, where one said it was a problem, one said it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But the majority of what we heard was from neighbors who were saying that this, this would be a hardship for them. So 
Right. I but, am. Uh, I want, I'm eager to hear the continued discussion because it's helpful. Well, let, let me ask this question too because it, it came up. Let me just yeah, respond yeah, to mm -hmm. this. Mr. Pisa, right now, mm -hmm. without coming to this board, mm -hmm. can keep a two family home yep. and rent that out to two families yep. who have three kids each who are of driving age, and there can mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. eight cars on that road. Well, the, 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 question, the question I have is cool. yes. I have no problem whatsoever if, if if the current owner wanted to completely renovate what was there, yeah. make it into a one family chip. A lot of the other special use exceptions that were granted, they weren't touching the, the, the house itself. They weren't expanding the house. They were simply changing the use, but everything was staying the same. Right. So this board felt comfortable granting right. a change in use. Mm -hmm. I can't say, you know, I, you know, two families are one family. If you expand the size of a house, right. you're inviting more activity. Whether it's two families or one, if you're adding bedrooms and adding square footage, you are increasing the amount of activity there. So I, I've listened to counsel for the applicants say that they're reducing density by converting it from a two family to a one family. You know, depending upon how you're you're defining that, okay. If you're expanding a house, that to me increases occupancy and is more likely to increase density and vehicular traffic. But the question I, I, I really wanted to, to raise is, is a legal question because we've always assumed because it showed on some <coughs> survey work that this was an easement, not a private road. My experience has been that you would be able to produce an easement document. And I think at one point you requested, Brian, an easement document, but we haven't found one. Or did you find one? Uh, they did provide that information. So you have an easement document? It's part of the record. Okay, I haven't seen that. If you have that, it, it would be interesting. Because at one time it was clearly a private road. All of the historical records show the definition. It, it's actually stamped on the I'm going to object uh, right now. On, on this the, is contrary to the building the, inspector's interpretation. I, I'm sorry, we're having deliberations. It, it doesn't matter. It's closed. You're it asking <laughs> ultra vires, and you're supposed to direct them to that. The building inspector's made a determination. You're arguing the determination. John, that jurisdiction is gone. John, do your job. Sit, you don't need to sit here and point to people. Do your job. You know the board has the right to interpret. Absolute, no, not. He is reinterpreting something that the building inspector interpreted. Have, he has absolutely right, no right, right to. No, you don't. Your board has no idea what you're talking about. So just to, in, but just to clarify, them, my question is, you, you, you did find an easement document that actually changes down. from a private road to an easement? Regardless, you have, you have a determination made by the building inspector. You can either follow it or you can... That's it. not true. It hasn't been challenged. It has to be challenged so look, by that's, somebody that's else. My, You're shit, wrong. Those, those are my issues. Tom, but, but again, it's, what, your, it's your vote. I'm just... With, yeah, this no, is no, just no. a discussion. A yeah, deliberation. Academically, how do you feel about going to a one-family house? I think that's an improvement. My concern is the 384 square feet okay. of additional density in what's already, by the standards of this village, a line of houses nearby to each other. I didn't express it very well, but it's no, a very I, crowded I understand. neighborhood. I understand. High density. Yeah. I mean, if you, it's a two-story house, right? If, if that 380 feet is being uh, spread over the two floors, we've only got... Um, 150 plus feet on both floors. That's a small bedroom. How um, big's the whole house now? I, I can say this. Yes. Two thirty thousand. How many times have we? So have it's a fifteen percent improvement. Yeah. Yeah. Seen an application where the applicant needed front yard, side yard, rear yard, aggregate side yard setback. Really. You're right. And if this were anywhere else. Okay, would we even be considering this? Well, look, don't forget. And, that. And, and, and I don't mean to interrupt you. Oh, that's fine. But, and, so close to a road, I'm just, I'm not seeing the, the expansion here. And, and my concern would be that the vacant lot will come forward at some point and just have a strong argument based upon this decision. Right. That they can build something similar with similar setbacks. And your argument you know, that that was the expansion of a pre-existing house is doesn't feel that strong to me. Right. But on the west side, they're not they're not extending. They're just right in place with the existing 
length of the there, left side. There, yeah, there, there. I mean, we had cases. You know, we had one on Roscoe Street where we were not going to allow the expansion of a nonconformity. In some cases, you can, right. but it's not a given. We don't have a what? What's on? What's north of this property? That is not another house, right? I'm, gonna, um, I'm not sure we'd have to look. Do you want yeah. to show us what's north? If it's, it's a parking lot for the old Woodward Street place. Right. So if we were to look at, if we we're considering a rear yard setback, we would say, hey, yeah. is there a neighbor there? Is there not a neighbor there? There's no mm -hmm. neighbor there. Mm -hmm. So that it gives me a little more sympathy towards sure. I agree. that north side. I, I agree with you, Mark. They're, they're asking for a lot. Um, it's It's... It's not a slam dunk for me, but I do think it's consistent with the street. It's <coughs> fine. It's just that, you know, my I, vote is my vote is is to deny the variances. We can vote on it. It's good to have yeah. deliberation. I'd like to hear uh, Joyce's opinion as well. Um, I I basically agree <coughs> with the opinion as written. To, de to deny these variances. Do you want to? I agree with Joyce. Okay. Where does that leave us? Four, four one. Right. Mm -hmm. you have to, to direct you to write a, an opinion, so I can motion to direct you to write an opinion yeah, or decision. Write, write a decision that yes. is consistent with what uh, you've discussed. I've given you some okay. some proposed. Uh, language that would support either direction, but this is this is uh, up to you. If you have, it appears you have a majority in one direction. You can move in that direction, uh, you know, and again, and not address the interpretation issue because uh, you can leave that you can leave that alone. But I'd like to hear that too. Well, would it make mm -hmm. sense? Maybe some. The, uh, I personally, I agree with the opinion of the building inspector as revised, mm -hmm. based on my review of the code. So, yeah, uh, uh, as do I. Um, can we, perhaps, from a, from a legal perspective, not not factually, but from a legal perspective, based on the way the, the language of the code reads in relation to roadways, can we make a determination on the special exemption request? Um, so that if the applicant wanted to redesign the house, they wouldn't have to ask for the special exemption again? Or do you think that that's specifically tied to what it is they're proposing? It's, it's a good question. You can separate them. The, the concern can, I have on the special exception use is when, when I delved into 116-22, the code states for every special exception use, the Board of Appeals should determine that the plot area is sufficient, appropriate, and adequate for the use and the reasonably anticipated operation and expansion thereof. And I was concerned that I, I agree that if it we're just converting a two family to a one family and keeping the structure as is, it, I have no doubt, no, you know, no problem with granting the special use, uh, exception use, the special exception use. But when you see that, that the code asks for the board to also determine you know, whether the plot area is sufficient for the expansion, that's that's where I that's where I have a problem granting the special exception. So, so you can look at it that, you case. can look at it this way then. You, you you can make your determination on the variances. You can also, uh, if necessary, approve if, if you choose to approve <coughs> the uh, the special exception use, but that would have to then be brought back to the building department for a subsequent uh, building permit application to obtain approval for building that in compliance with code. If variances are required, it would have to come back to this board, and this board would have to render a determination and could consider the impacts that you are talking about in rendering that determination. But as uh, Mr. Farron is pointing out, if you grant the special exception use permit now, and they do come back to the building department with a zoning compliant, uh, a zoning compliant building, they won't have to come back to this board again and go through this process. So you can, can certainly consider splitting them. And while I heard that they, you want to deny the variances, you can uh, grant the special exception use. 
And Brian, just to follow up on that, my understanding is that the second request that has to do with the number of square feet per dwelling unit is related to the special exception request. So I think those would probably have to go together. So the lot area. Right, the lot yeah, area. I for, agree. Mm -hmm. So in, in order to have a yeah, single so, family. So if that's the, if that's the intent, uh, rather than denying the variances in total, uh, and the intent is to approve the special exception use, requested uh, included with that so they would not have to come back here if they again if they propose something compliant would be uh, not granting number two which is to permit the lot area to be 82 63 square feet with 20,000 square feet is, permit, is required I'm not, I'm not sure it helps them at all because it, I would still want them to come back with a plan that the board should see in its entirety if it's compliant you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to if right it, but it wouldn't compliant because of the special use exception right but if it's co it's coming to you primarily because what they're seeking to do is well for two reasons seeking to expand it and seeking variances that are necessary in relation to that you have some that are uh, just essentially running along the same pro same line as the existing building and then you have two that are completely new for the aggregate side yard setback and for the parking uh, setback If, if they go back, again, if they go back to the building department with a zoning compliant structure, why make them come back to the zoning board for they relief for the special exception use on the same size lot that will not change? If it was, okay, yeah. So, so zoning no compliant just, means the same number of square feet as it now is? I think. Yeah. No, they would, no, they would be talking about removing the structure completely and building or proposing to build something new within, within the, current, the envelope. The current well, let, me, let me ask Alex this. If they did do that, if they came back and n numbers three, four, and five were the same, let's say, or three, three and four were the same as exists currently, or, or a sm uh, smaller encroachment, would a variance be required under the way that we read the code? For those encroachments. I'd have to con what, want to confirm that with the chief building inspector. My way of reading this is that these setbacks are the required for OD. If there's a new structure, I think it would be held to the new set, um, new uh, leads, the required setbacks. So, they so it could apply. be expanded in accordance with those setbacks potentially, but anything, it couldn't be expanded consistent with a non conforming setback. That makes sense. So if they if if they had a fifteen for, if they encroach let's say number three, mm -hmm. if it was to if the existing is twenty three point five, mm -hmm. and they propose a building that's twenty three point five, and already have the special exception use permit, already have the variance for the lot area, would they be sent back to this board for a variance to rebuild a new structure in that same location? That's what your notice says. I believe that they. They would. Typically, when someone has a non-conforming setback, they're not okay. permitted to expand that, right. uh, that setback. They so, can only build to the required setback. So, so if that's the case, then the only way that they wouldn't have to come back to you uh, if you were to grant one and two would be if the building met the front yard, rear yard, side yard, and aggregate side yard setbacks. Mark, you, you should were, just deny the whole thing. Let's get to it, okay? Because the conforming building area is about 15 feet, 20 feet deep. You just can't build a house there. But if you take the front yard setback and the rear yard setback, Luke, that's... Uh, I'm, I'm, tr I'm, try I'm trying to help you guys with future applications. Mark, what, it, what would your building thought be if this, this application you know? were to just... Um, renovate the existing structure, not add any new footprint. You know, it's wonderful. It would still need all these variances. No, it wouldn't. According to your building department. Uh, no, if, if they re rebuilt exactly what was there and just renovated the interior, there's no variances required. No one's going to do that. Is that your question? I, I thought yeah, no one's gonna I do thought that. you just said that they would need to come back here. Did I misunderstand I think you? It I think if it depends if we're talking about a new structure or a renovation, or if they're expanding in line with existing uh, yeah. setbacks, or if they're building to the allowable setback. A anything yeah. expanded in that in the permitted building envelope right. is permissible. And you know, renovations are 
are permissible uh -huh, in uh -huh. the current setbacks, but right. the current setbacks can't be expanded. But he can't um, he can't demo everything except the foundation and build a new house. I believe top. it that would be considered a new building, which would be have to conform to setbacks. That's my understanding. But that I would you would be from. okay with that to renovate the existing. If he removed everything except the foundation, that's a building department question. Yeah. yeah. Well, and they and they were back here for for the same variances. I, Luke, I, it's. It's a hypothetical. So, yeah. okay. I'm, gonna I, I only, you know, I'm gonna withdraw the application. I'm gonna withdraw the application. And we'll and we'll come back with something new. I'm 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 hereby withdrawing the application. Which I've done before the vote. And that's my absolute right. So I'm gonna withdraw the application. We'll come and back we with something vote. new. So it's withdrawn. Okay. Case. I'm gonna let's just adjourn for a little while. Why don't we take a break? The application is wrong. That's with my absolute right. Can we do that, Brian? That correct? You can, you can stay. Yeah, okay. you don't have to just take me. Yeah. Take, we'll take a minute. That's fine. Thank you. Just you shouldn't be. We're ready for case number 3162, 146 Halsey Street, Sydney Guevara and Sally Antoine. And I hope I pronounced their names correctly. For the Just applicant, John Bennett. Uh, and Mr. Bennett provided, as he did with the other applications, an affidavit of posting, affidavit of mail. There are two aspects of this. One is to seek approval to construct additions on an existing non-conforming residence, of which less than 88.6 square feet is located in the re required setback. It's a very, very minor request to infill the existing residence. There's been no contrary application. Uh, uh, there's been no opposition whatsoever. There's nothing been no comment by the board. Uh, it's a, uh, just to, uh, as shown in the survey, this 88.6 square foot infill so we can uh, uh, reconstruct the house. I'd ask the board to make a determination on that. I'm going to withdraw the pool application. <clears throat> Does anybody from the public wish to be heard on this? Can, I just want to ask a question. You said 88.6 square feet for the addition. I, it's I just a little infill. I'm sorry. Yeah, Billy, when I was come looking up. at it today, I thought it was 4 by 8 for 32. Are you referring to two stories, or is there something something more? Approximately eight by four feet, the proposed addition. So it okay. So it's about thirty-two square feet. Yeah. But thirty-two square feet, not yep. eighty-eight. It's it's two stories up. Oh, it is okay. Yeah. So okay. Sixty-four. So feet. about sixty-four, sixty-five well, square feet. I'm eighty. It's eight point two by four oh. approximately. So I rounded. I'm, I apologize. So. Okay. It's it's that little. See, it's a, on the survey, little proposed addition right there. It's about sixty-five and a half square feet based on the numbers you provided. We can't see it actually yet. Still not. Any board members have any questions? I do not. Um, Joyce signed off for the record from uh, Zoom attendance. Okay. And does anybody from the public wish to be heard on uh, on this case, 146 Halsey Street?
Hello, board members, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so with the adjournment, I may have missed the uh, uh, announcement and the preamble. And uh, so by the way, this is uh, Jeff Broadway. I'm a resident at 166 Halsey Street. Uh, and this is in regard to uh, the application 146 Halsey Street. So I, um, did I hear John correctly that they're withdrawing the application for the pool? Yes. Okay. Uh, so then my comments were really related to the pool to the extent that that's withdrawn. Uh, I don't have an issue uh, other than those that might be architectural in nature, which I can find on at the appropriate time. So uh, I turn it back to the uh, CBA to do what they do best, and you guys do it well, so thank you. Of course. I, I, I do want to note that as a result of some colloquy that I had with uh, Mr. Um, Jeff, uh, we Jeff was concerned that we were taking away uh, a uh, bay window in the front. He thought that added to this the house. We, we put that back on. The reason we took the bay window off was to try to reduce the amount of relief. Mr. Broadley wanted it on there. It's existing, so we're leaving it there. And you know, so we're we're, we're trying again to be responsive. Thank you. You've, yeah, and, you've been and, to them already? Excuse me? You've been to the ARB already for this? Nope. No. Okay. No, no, it's, it's following the normal se sequence. And to the extent that the CBA <clears throat> has uh, weighed in and, uh, and the applicant has, I think there's a sincere effort to uh, uh, keep this house with its historic nature and in the context of the neighborhood. So thank you all. It's not a historic residence, but it just no, for the record. No, I know, but in the historic, I think I said historic nature, John. <laughs> Does anybody else from the public wish to be heard? Is there anybody else? Thank you, Jeffrey. All right, thank you all. Take it. Bye-bye. Okay, so I'm going to motion to, to close case number 3162, uh, 146 Halsey Street. Can I have a second? Second. <coughs> and all in favor? Aye. Aye. And then I will motion to grant the variance for the front yard setback for the residents. And could I have a second? Can we also add in that to use the short form? Uh, short form is not uh, oh, code, not yet. The code no, yet. No, okay. Okay. they have a hearing on July 11th. So hopefully Got after that. Got it. So do we? Is there okay? A so the motion is to grant the variance for the front yard setback. Really. Second that. And all It'll in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll get a one. Get you one. Circulate for me. So review. moving on, we have What's next case review? number 3177-865 Maricopa LLC, LLC 22 Windmill Lane. Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Liz Vale. I'm with Greenberg Traurig, 2317 Montauk Highway. Bridgehampton for the applicant, 865 Merrick Holdings. The property is located at 22 Windmill Lane. I'm here tonight with uh, Rick Wesnowski of the Rainer Group in case you have any specific questions about the plans or the septic proposed. Um, he can answer them. And so tonight we are seeking variances to construct a two-story, 7,322-square-foot office building at 22 Windmill Lane where the property is 9,462 square feet, and it's located in the VB zoning district. Uh, specifically, we require variances from 116-14D to allow a reduction in the minimum, minimum number of required off-street parking from 22 spaces to eight spaces. Therefore, we require a variance for 14 spaces under that section. We also need a variance from 116-14E to reduce the minimum number of required truck loading spaces from one to zero. Um, we need a variance from 116-11.3E2 to increase the maximum front yard setback for the first story from the required three feet to 9.5 feet. And this, we should note, this is where 7.5 feet is existing. Um, and then also from 116-11.3E3 to reduce the minimum span or frontage width of the principal building from 90% to 85.4%. My colleague David Gilmartin was here last time in May, and I believe he presented to you um, this application and how it met the five-part test. Um, I've also prepared a statement in support 
mostly because I got sick, you have to excuse my voice, um, for, for the application to submit to the board. One, two, three, here we go. Um, just showing how we do meet the five-part test um, and explaining that the majority of variances for this site are really dictated by this trapezoid-shaped lot, um, which is, again, 9,462 um, square feet. And in the front, it's about 91 linear feet long, but then it goes back to a rear yard um, of only 21 feet. So you can see due to the shape of this um, building and the existing layout of the structures on site, which is where the parking is here already as well, and then also the historic structure that we want to restore is wrapped um, in an existing building right where this is. So we're sort of we're sort of dictated by what's existing and the shape and of this lot and, and how it's all laid out existing um, for, for the way it is. I also went through the standards um, in my statement of support of how we meet the extra standards required for parking variances in Village Code Section 116-28F, which are specific types of variances, standards that are added for the ZBA to consider when you're waiving parking in the Village of Southampton. Um, and some of those standards mostly have to do with the proximity of municipal parking. And here we have an abutting um, municipal parking lot to the south which is located, it's in my statement, sorry, give me one second. It's located at 27, I oh know that's the one to the north, my apologies, hold on. The one to the south is located at 25 Job's Lane. Um, and you can see it's, it's, a, it's to the south of the existing lot, it's in the picture in the statement of support on page seven. Um, and it, it's municipal parking that's abutting the existing lot. And then the other municipal lot that's obviously really close by, it's 50 feet away approximately from the measurement I took on GIS, is at 27 West Main Street. And that includes um, the parking along the road by the bank and, of course, the larger main parking lot, um, the municipal lot that we're all familiar with at 27 West Main Street. So, and the standard is, is whether or not those municipal parking is available within 500 feet of the lot. And obviously, this is much closer. Um, so we wanted to point that out specifically. Also, the client um, is, is willing to pay the fee in lieu of parking, which is $8,000 per um, space. And I did um, present some uh, precedent-setting decisions, which I noted to the board um, in my statement of support as well, which is the 9 Main Street decision dated November 19, 2015, where they waived um, 10 parking spaces and one truck loading space. Again, relying on the fact that the municipal parking areas are close and the required off-street parking fee waiver of 8,000 per space was paid. And that was the rationale for that decision. And then also 16 Hampton Road, which is called a Dialects Realty decision dated September 22nd, 2016. It's also precedent setting. And that waived eight parking spaces for a second story office um, in the VB zoning district. And again, the analysis was based on the mitigating factor of nearby municipal parking areas, and that was abutting as well. And of course, the $8,000 off-street parking fee waiver to grant the variances. That's just a basic outline. I'd encourage the board to please um, read the statement in support and let me know if you have any questions. Liz, do you have a copy I can put in the file? Of course. I have Thanks. many copies. And you email this as well? Thank you. Thank you. Does the board have any questions for me or Rick? We are proposing a new low nitrogen septic system. That's also dictated for variances because the septic system is going to be over here in this area. And Rick can expand on that if you have questions about it. How did you land on eight spots as opposed to, say, 10? Just the size of um, the building and the, the way the lot is set up. You mean putting two more here? Mm -hmm. I think it's based on the turnaround. Can you talk about it? as to why we couldn't add two extra spaces here. You, you may also want to point out the existing village spaces. They're all right here. Right. The village parking is right here. Oh, okay. We thought about like doing something with the village where we sort of evened that out or made it better somehow. But we yeah. Need permission uh, from the village to do that. Rick Wasowski, the Rainer Group. Um, we actually spoke with Steve Phillips, um, the DBW superintendent, and he's on board with um, the plan that we had for parking. And yet the reason we can't have those two extra spots to the east is because there's existing village parking spots 
Okay, that makes sense. That's where see. What about um, to the west? One spot. Uh, that's where the uh, sanitary system is going, and based on high, the high groundwater, we can't. Uh, it can't be traffic bearing, so we can't have any structures. You know, any parking over the structures. Any part of the sanitary system going underneath that proposed deck? Uh, the leaching is yes. Okay. The deck I understand was from um, Carl is just to make your variance request for the street front frontage requirement less. I mean, that's not, no, that's not. I mean, obviously the deck is proposed as part of this development. It's the intention is not just to meet the street frontage requirement, but it's required to be a deck because of the septic field, leaching field that has to be okay. present there. So it's not like we could put the structure there as right, much as why, we'd want to, right? Why and, does the client want a deck there? I was told it was because, and Rick can speak to this more because he actually helped design it, but it was because of having a sort of a greener space area or an outdoor area for, you know, office employees to eat lunch or whatever. I mean, they said they would also keep it open for the public, but okay. just sort of an, an outside gathering area. I, I think at the last hearing, there was something said about it being over a sanitary system. Yes, or something. that's what we just said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I, I maybe then I guess I miss heard Carl, right, because you have uh, your request number four, reduce the minimum span. You mean of David, right? Sorry. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, David Gilmore. Yeah. yeah. Rooney. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry. I'm like, where's Carl? <laughs> <laughs> um, I could have sworn he said that was to extend the building so that you're only asking for 85.4%. Well, I'm sure it has that function, but I don't think that yeah. was the intent of building it like that. I think we have to build a deck because you have to have the area underneath for the sanitary. That's my understanding. And they didn't want correct? to just leave grass? Is that too? Um, I mean, we can go back to the uh, applicant and speak to if he just wanted grass there. Um, but then the grade would be a little higher. Why? Because of the water table depth? Yes, correct. And you couldn't increase the number of pools to mitigate that? Um, well, we don't really even have pools right now. We have a, it's like an ATL inf infiltrator system sure. um, that takes up that whole space. I mean, I can show you this sanitary plan if you want to see. So the two sanitary structures are right here. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we're also required by the health department to be 20 feet away from a retaining wall. Um, technically, it's not really a retaining wall. It's only uh, a foot and a half high. Um, so it's not a retaining wall. Depends on how the, the definition is in the code. Um, we it, just it's said retaining. It's like retaining. Technically, it's not a retaining wall. According to the health department, it's a retaining wall because it has the potential to retain sewage. Oh, we are increasing the facade, right, Rick? Um, I don't know where that number was, but the front building, the existing versus the post, is getting, um, what was it, from 46 to 46? It's hard to read it upside down. No, but the width is increasing. In other words, the, the existing building was much smaller in the front edge, and now it's still increasing. Is that what you're saying? You'd like to see the front bigger? I just don't, I don't know if this is the best you guys can do. Um, With respect to what? All, all of it. Um, why isn't the building longer on windmill and less deep to the east? Right, like why why isn't the why doesn't the building take up the entire length of windmill, and have sort of a trapezoidal shape, with a bunch of parking in the rear? Well, is, isn't that because of the septic? I mean, I, I thought that's what he was going over. So you're saying cut the back, and put the septic back there, if it's feasible. Mm. That would somehow wouldn't that impact the parking? Hello. 
Hold on, let's see. Can I just ask a quick clarifying question? Because one of the hazards of sitting on these boards is you often end up watching other boards. And I don't recall there being a deck when this was presented with the ARB. Am I wrong about that? I actually was not retained it when it was presented to ARB. So okay. if you can answer that. I think it's. I think it was proposed to be a deck the whole time, but I'd have to go back and check. But okay, I, I'm just I'm pretty sure my site plans like had this. has had the deck on it. But I believe it okay. was discussed when it was in front of the planning board, is my recollection, um, okay. and, and probably the ARB uh, as well. I just don't remember. See, I don't. I just don't remember it. So it's been. I'm sitting here thinking, was it there? Is it there? We are before the planning board, and yeah. So that's yeah. a good question. Oh, I is certainly I'm supportive of. The redevelopment of this property the deck just seems really weird to me um and just kind of like out of character for the village mm. um which i'm sure you objectively can agree with but i don't know i mean mark what do you think if i'm just wondering how it affects the variances and if, if you think that it affects their their number of parking lot variances that's in our purview that's in our purview but yeah if you're if you're concerned more about you know the the appearance or something like that i it's just not it's not within our purview yeah yeah right um what was your point that they could they could find a way to request fewer parking I mean, potentially, I think that would right? Like, the what's parking. the total square footage of the um, of the building, proposed building? It's seven thousand three hundred square feet. Right. So yeah, if everything that is traveling east were sort of smushed to the southwest, and maybe give the building a slightly more regular shape. Do you think we'd have room for parking in septic? I mean, that's a design issue. I don't. I don't think that would help with the parking. Um, because I think, you know, you, where you have the building now, that's where you would have your sanitary system rather than, you know, in the front where the deck is proposed. So I think you would probably there's be... There's also a right-of-way behind it, remember? Mm -hmm. There's a right-of-way that goes behind the quotations and everything. Liz, do you have the, the one that's overlaid on the aerial? I know it was part of the site plan submission. I don't know if it was part of the submission as well. I, 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 I don't, pull it up I don't know if I called. I don't know if I have that one with me. But this is, a, I think, this... This, this area would be either here, maybe the right away, right back here. It's this right here. So then this, right from here to here. No, it's just to here. Okay. So it doesn't, so it, it doesn't bisect the property. No. no. So it's along the rear of that area. I think that um, when I look at this in isolation, it feel it is a significant request. Okay. We happen to be in a period of time when we've had a lot of parking requests mm -hmm. for changes at the same time that there's also been a reduction of spaces on Hill Street. And uh, I did ask at our last meeting that we look at the totality of the requests that are being made uh, to us uh, for diminished parking spaces by a multitude of projects that are very nearby. Um, so my concern is, is that the significance of this, which is certainly more than 50%, and would by any standard be considered a, a, a significant request to us, I, 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 that gives me pause. But I'm also very interested, as any resident in the village of Southampton would be, in the redevelopment of this project. There's a hole in the roof in the back. And it's, it's very dilapidated. It's, um, it has long been yeah. seeking someone who will care for it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to really understand if this is the best request for parking variances that could be made for this project. Okay. Um, the comments and questions that have been asked this evening 
make it clear to me that there's more there's still more work to be done to fully understand that um, and that's for me where my concern is I I do I very much am delighted that someone is putting the time and attention into this particular property mm -hmm. and that the historic structure that's we'll inside restored. the building yeah. will be restored. It has been long discussed and you know it will be a, a tremendous add mm -hmm. to the village. But I also worry that no one can get to it if the maximum number of parking spaces are not considered for the space. Okay. So well I appreciate that feedback. Sure. Does anybody else have feedback? No. Liz, I'm sorry if I missed it. Did you go through any, if there were any mitigating um, things to reduce the parking stall demand reduction? Well, that yeah, that's in my statement of support. The okay. fact mm -hmm. that um, it's a proposed office use as opposed to um, a retail or restaurant use in BB is also mitigating because the office use doesn't occur at night when those other uses are in, in play. And that is something that the board considered um, with some of the precedent that's been determined by the board. Also, I would encourage the board to really look at the standards, um, the variant standards that apply in 116-28F, because those standards are specifically for parking variances, and they they are met by this application. Um, I understand that you think it's substantial, but when you do look at the size and shape of the lot, the area of the existing parking structure, the area of the existing um, the existing um, well, former apartment building um, and the proposed historic um, renovation, you can tell it is restricted pretty considerably. And so when you consider that the proximity of the municipal parking, the parking fee waiver fee, and also the fact that it's going to be office spaces, it all mitigates the potential impacts of waiving 14 spaces and one truck loading space. Do you have any other issues with the other variance requests, which are by and large minimal the setback from three feet to 9.5 and the okay could you remind me do we have bike parking on the site plan I, i'm trying i think that was something that was maybe discussed at planning bike board. parking if, if parking for bicycles it, well if we do it's not something we're requesting a variance for so it's no, not understood. before this board i just but meant can, as a potential mitigating factor to help we reduce could the yeah we of, could consider that yeah and i yeah, think it had sure. been discussed at, at the planning board at some point yeah and generally speaking, you know, um, when you have shared parking, when you can offer shared easements between lots, that's often mitigating too. But here, since the municipal lots are budding, I don't know that we can we can't improve a municipal lot. So that's not something we're committed there's, to do. There's parking nearby for sure, yeah. but yep. um, I, I just don't know what's driving the bus here: the location of the sanitary or the. I think it, it's the location of the sanitary, the existing building, um, where it's situated, the shape yeah. of the lot and where we can actually physically fit parking on site. Yeah. So that's the three things that are driving this development. But I do appreciate feedback. So what we'll do is we'll seek an adjournment and we'll bring this information back to our client and, and see if they have any changes they'd like to make. Okay. Does anybody from the public wish to be heard? Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll motion to adjourn for all purposes. Uh, case number 3177. Oh, is somebody, is somebody? wants to be heard. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Good evening. <coughs> we can hear you and we can yeah. Hello, I'm David Silverstein. I'm the applicant uh, for 865 Merrick LLC. Um, I apologize. I did raise my hand online for the last meeting and I wasn't picked up. But I did want to take a few moments to explain the plan, why we are where we are, and you know, just kind of give a little color as to how this is the only viable plan after about the... Sorry, my screen is shifting. We can see you. Uh, after two years of, uh, of effort in this and consultants and a uh, considerable cost, and I don't know if you're aware, I'm the third developer who has tried to do something with this property. The other two were, were unsuccessful. 
and uh, I have to say I'm kind of understanding why that is. Um, there's a couple of things that plague this property. Number one, if there's any interest in the historic preservation, as is mine, uh, maintaining this house on its site in its original historic location uh, is a challenge. Uh, we have a building that was built around the existing building. That's the building that you had noted is uh, collapsing in the back. It's my intention to remove that building and expose the historic structure, which dates back to the uh, 18th century. So, you know, that, that's the, the primary challenge. The secondary challenge is the septic and the sanitary. Where does it go? How does it work? The Rainer Group has spent a lot of time with this. The location in that corner of the property is the only viable location for it. Uh, that provides parking as well as exposes the existing structure and um, gives us that option. As far as a deck goes, we don't have to have a deck. Uh, it, it was an effort to provide public space and a place for people in Windmill Lane and reading the comprehensive plan for the village uh, to give people a place to, to gather and uh, that kind of spot, that kind of uh, amenity on Windmill Lane. And I think in light of the development that you mentioned with the doubling of the capacity of the restaurant of the block and what's happening across the street and provisions, I, I would have thought that a public gathering space would be a welcome uh, addition, not something that was uh, frowned upon, but if it is, I, I certainly don't have to have it. Uh, as far as bicycle parking, I have a whole bicycle store next door, but bike racks are certainly not a problem to add on to that. And um, I'm just interested to hear what thoughts you, the board might have in citing this property better that uh, you know, it doesn't consider the constraints that the property has or respects the restoration of the, the Rhodes House. Well, so an objection to the deck is not an objection to a public gathering space. They're mutually exclusive, and it's a false equivalency to suggest that that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> Second, with respect to the historic house, you know as well as I do that that building is going to be completely taken apart and the beams that are gonna be deemed worth saving are gonna be numbered and they're gonna lay flat on the ground for a couple months. So there really is no issue with moving portions of it around a little bit. It's, it's not a static thing when you're gonna get into a structure that is so old and so degraded. Um, you know, I, I think you should really try to get more spots on the lot and I think you should investigate the sanitary system uh, as far to the northeast as you can get it. And if that drives the, the shape of the building in a different direction, then that's the way you need to go. But the, the deck... Have, have, the, what's your, what, sorry, go ahead. I'm done. Go ahead. Yeah, what you're suggesting is is been considered for, for years. Uh, it's been studied. I have what, who I feel are the best consultants for this you know, in this area. And, uh, you know, we've, we've looked at the parking, we've had meetings with the, the Board of Health, we've come up with this plan. And uh, there is no better option that we are aware of or our consultants are aware of that will make this happen as you're suggesting and provide more parking on the space, on the lot rather. So, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Wisnowski, what's your first name again? Rick. Rick. Um, you looked, you looked at the far corner, and why doesn't it work? I mean, I think the purpose is we're, we're trying to have the historic structures exposed, and that's right. why we don't want to build, you know, further south with the building. Like how you, I think sure. that's like what you're trying to mm -hmm. say. You just like kind of rotate how it, instead of going east-west, go north-south, kind of. I think big picture, we're sympathetic to the, to some level of parking variance, right? Um, so I don't want eight spots is, you know, <laughs> does seven spots allow the sanitary system to go in the backyard? Um, I, I just, I'm, I haven't been told why it specifically doesn't work. Uh, yeah, so, the, so, so this system is not traffic bearing. And because of the the high groundwater in this area, uh, it, it can it cannot be traffic bearing. 
I'm not suggesting that it be traffic bearing. I'm I'm just suggesting that it be located in the northeast. We, corner we also need street. to be it also needs to be five feet away from property lines. Okay. So you know, in the back where it narrows, you're really restricting your right your width there. Right. So that's another that was another reason. And then once you do that, then you're probably losing a lot of your parking. Well, not necessarily, right? Because um, were the building loaded more <clears throat> towards the west, um, perhaps I... You, you also said in the first hearing that you have two handicap spots, but you only need one. The, pl right. the planning board uh, requested two. Okay. So that's so that's why need, there's two. So two. Um, okay. By code, okay. one is required. All right. The planning so maybe board requested you can get two. One, you know, take a spot from the east side and put it over onto the west side. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? <clears throat> yeah, what, what if your your bank of parking just slid um, west if the sanitary system were relocated? Sanitary system cannot be relocated. Yeah, I, like a, I can tell by your face. I mean, you know that it without be relocated. changing, the, I mean, you're changing the whole building um, if you're doing that. There, there is drainage units proposed in that back area. Right? Yes, we do. Yeah, we have proposed drainage in the back. Um, no, yes. no, no, no. Uh, we're just let's just slide that block down. You want to slide this over here and have this. Yes. Yes. So I mean, you probably you could maybe get one more space, um, but probably not. Uh, we've looked into that. I'm not even arguing for you to add more spaces necessarily. Take away spaces, but relocate the sanitary system, site the building in a better location, and see what sort of parking. You're sort of letting the cart uh, drive the horse or the horse. That is right? not. That is that is not any anywhere accurate or an informed comment. I'm sorry. You know, listen, guys, I don't, I don't mean to vent my frustration on this board, but this has been a very, very long process, as Mr. Wallach could probably attest to. And I've spent more money on this and more time. And it was all from the intention of saving a historic building and adding benefit to the village. And if you are not confident that what we're saying is accurate and this is the best plan we can put forward, then we'll have no choice but to but to leave it to the next developer to go on to guy number four. So has uh, every development project that you've ever done just been easy for you? Whether my, my experience as a developer is, is not a matter to discuss with this board. My okay, so your frustrations with, notwithstanding, this isn't really the place to air your frustrations. I happen to do this every day, okay? So for you to tell me that my opinion is misinformed? Have you no, I think, I think what have we could studied, do. Have you studied the setbacks? that are required for the septic system and examine the sanitary system. If I may, if I may, I think what we could do, um, David and board members, is simply adjourn it so that we could address all of those issues for this board. So we can show them in writing or with our plan as to why that would be impossible. So that you can feel confident when you're making your decision that we did explore those other avenues and you're not just taking our word for it, but we're showing you that as well. Okay, and my, just underscore this. You're, you're using some very lazy false equivalencies. I'm not saying that you shouldn't go forward with this project. I'm saying I'm trying to improve it for you because I know what I'm talking about. You, you have a strong opinion in the other direction. I'm telling you that you can put the sanitary in a different location. All right. So me saying try for another location on the sanitary. I don't want to hear boo hoo. I'm taking my toys and I'm going home. When you take it constructively and make some adjustments, so or go I, away, I, I, it doesn't I, I, matter. I just, I just do not. I just honestly, sir, I do not know where we would move the sanitary to, and we have tried every every possible location, and this is where it landed, based on all the constraints that were put upon us by the planning board and put upon us by the Suffolk County Department of Health Services. If, if we, you approach the property with a whole a all new set of eyes, I'm sure that you will find a location for the sanitary system that's not where it is, it doesn't need this weird deck, and you know, maybe it requires more parking variances. That's not the issue. It's, 
I think there's I think there's more well, to be done. We are trying to mini- minimize the part of the variances. We have an obligation to do that. Right. So we are trying to minimize the amount of variances that we're requesting from the board. And it's certainly the number of spaces we'd like to minimize that as well. Right. But that but being said, I mean, we'll take your comments to heart and we'll we'll show you we'll we'll consider what you're saying and we'll mm-hmm. certainly, you know, evidence why this is our proposed plan yeah. and why this is the only area for the subject that I we mean, can, Liz, you can that we believe is feasible. You can potentially okay? eliminate variance request number four. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. And uh, again, you spent money, you spent time. That has nothing to do with this board. I don't want to hear those complaints again. They're just unnecessary. Okay. Do any other board members have any comments? No. No, we should. Uh, we'll adjourn for all purposes. Thank you. That work for you. Um, so, in case somebody, number three, there's someone else who wants to be heard. Oh, um, I apologize. On Zoom. Yeah. While that person comes in, I'll just remind the board that uh, this is currently planning for a site plan review in front of the planning board. They've taken lead agency um, for, for secret purposes. Um, they've also presented to the board of architectural review some, some concepts. Um, as you probably know, it, the ARB is very, very sensitive to relocating historic buildings. Knowing that this building was relocated to this, this current location, that's something that they only grant in very, very rare circumstances. We do know, though, from a construction protocol standard, when you're gonna save an old building like this, they don't leave it sitting there, right? They're gonna take it apart, it's gonna be inventoried and numbered, and it's gonna be moved off site for a period of time while the new stuff is built, and then it's going to be put back in, right? So they may not, it's not as if like a sensitivity to an existing structure is really in, in practice what's going on. I think I understand what you're saying from a construction point. You're yeah. saying from the perspective of the ARB is yeah. they want things as they've historically been in relation to the street. Yeah, I get it. And I'm not saying... And, and that's, that's come up in discussions yeah. of this. As well. And I probably should. as your client should probably not uh, I should, I should. join in anymore. I should also note, just note for the record, that the planning board did issue, a, a, adopt a negative declaration in connection with this application on April 1st, 2024. Yeah, thank you for that just reminder. Just record. Is the person still coming in, Sage? Yes, I'm here. Ah, okay. So I stuck around and I'm glad I did. So this is Jeff Darby, a uh, resident of 166 Halsey Street and former, uh, or seem to be former board member and chair, former chair member of the ARB. So I'd like to speak to uh, Julia's point and Luke's point. Uh, Julia is correct. Uh, in the applications or actually the meetings that were held before the ARB, there was no deck that I can recall, and the ARB has been very uh, concerned about decks in residential areas, let alone commercial areas that are visible to the street, so I don't recall that, um, and so this raises the whole question that in my mind, this application is perhaps the quintessential poster child for one that requires a comprehensive review by all boards, not to be parsed out from one board to the next with uh, nuances from one board to the next. I realize there's a protocol and a procedure. They came before the ARB for referral, which was the correct way to do it, to then go to the uh, ZBA, which they are doing. Some of the references have not been uh, consistent with the meetings that were held before the ARB. I'm not going to take anybody to task but it just raises the whole question as to, uh, or I should say the need for a comprehensive approach to this. And Alex was correct in his statement that the way this presents to the street in its historic character, uh, whether rebuilt from scratch, as Luke was saying, with the uh, various elements preserved as an inventory, as Luke was saying, uh, that's critically important. And extensive work has been done by uh, the village historic consultant, uh, both in with this application and in the prior applications as to uh, those elements, including down to the window sashes, as to what's historic and what needs to be preserved. So uh, adjourn, yes, uh, that you will. And I only ask that going forward, this be viewed in a very comprehensive, thorough, and detailed way uh, and with, with all the 
aspects being considered. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks. Can I just say one more thing? Of course. I just have to address that because obviously each board has separate jurisdiction, and yes. I would I would encourage you not to do some sort of like great big meeting on one application and treat it differently than every other application that's come before the village of Southampton. So thank you. Thank you. So let, let's motion to. Uh, is there anybody else before we? Okay. Then let's motion to close for all purposes case number three one seven seven. Not close. Adjourn Adjourn. for all purposes. <laughs> thank you, Rowan. And that's to Windmill Lane. Uh, can I have a second? And that's second. to July 25th. Is it to July 25th? Is that okay with you? Okay, to July 25th. One favor. And a second? And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so the next and, and last uh, matter is that we will motion to accept the adjournment request July 25th for case number 3179, uh, 20 Hillcrest Avenue. Can I have a second? Second. Okay. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And, and then, then uh, we will motion to 70, um, which is previously adjourned to July 9th, will be adjourned further to July 25th. I'm sorry, which, which one? Do uh, we have to do that? Uh, 3178 Leslie and Craig Harwood. Oh, correct. It, that was previously adjourned to the 9th, which has been mm -hmm. since been canceled. Okay, so we'll motion oh. to adjourn case number 3178 Leslie and Craig Harwood, 1770 Meadow Lane. Uh, will be adjourned to the next public hearing, which is July 25th, not July 9th. Can I have a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. And then we can motion to close the public hearing June 27th, 2024. Can we have a second? Second. second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Before Aye. we close it, can we thank you guys oh, for your time on the board? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you to Mark. <laughs> thank you to Julia. You guys have been great. I second I've that. learned so much from you both. Thank you. It's been our pleasure. Now we can close it. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.